morning, I want us to see and truly understand what is a Holy Spirit encounter. But first, let's set the tone. Let's turn to Daniel 11.32, and it says, And such as violate the covenant, he shall pervert and seduce with flatteries. But the people who know their God, get that phrase right there, the people who know their God shall prove themselves strong and shall stand firm and do exploits for God. So here Daniel is telling us two things will happen to those who know their God. First, they will be strong. Strong in what? Strong in their faith. Strong in their convictions. Strong in their belief in who their God is. The second thing that will happen is they will do exploits. They will do great things. They will do awesome and wonderful things. Signs and wonders will come after them. Just like we saw in the Bible, it will continue. It does continue to happen to this day to those who what? Know their God. And I want us to see that the word know in this verse, that word know, it refers to an intimacy. And the Bible uses this word when a man knows his wife, but this also refers to the intimacy when man knows their God. It's two types of intimacies. The same kind of heart goes into each intimacy. It refers to the intimacy between two people. When you truly have that deep love and affection for the other person, that is what he wants. He wants us to be not only in a deep affection, he wants us to be so in love with him that we remember who he is to us. Now follow me here, because this isn't just a physical intimacy. It's a spiritual intimacy as well. Spiritual intimacy. Because, you see, when a man knows a woman, it's not just physical. They experience something spiritual as well. And that spiritual int intimacy is the same thing that happens when we know our God. See, when a man and women are intimate, the woman receives a seed from the man. Her body then starts to adapt. The moment she receives that seed, her body starts to adapt and change to the growth and the maturity of that seed. Change so that it can keep helping that seed grow healthy. But not only does her body adapt, she has to adapt what she does and what she eats so that that seed can continue to grow healthy and strong. So she stops eating some things that might harm the seed. She stops doing some activities that might hurt the seed. And it's the same in the spiritual realm. When we come before God and we have that true encounter, that intimate time with him, we receive a spiritual seed from God, from the Holy Spirit. And our, our spirit must adapt as it begins to grow and flourish. Or else what can happen? It may stunt the growth of that seed, or it may make that seed wither and die if we're not careful. But because if we keep doing what we did before receiving the Holy Spirit seed, it can be stolen from us as well. Because what is the job of the enemy? Kill, steal, and destroy. And if we don't have that strength, we don't have that conviction, he can kill, steal, and destroy the Spirit seed. 
That's what the disciples were doing in the upper room. But did you know? Did you know that it grieves the Holy Spirit when he sends his blessings, but they're not received with a heart of honor or desperation? When we don't have that desire, that need to be in his presence when he sends those blessings to us. It grieves him. It breaks his heart because he wants us to continue to press in. He wants us to have that need to be in his presence, the desire to seek him out daily, moment by moment. That's what the disciples were doing. In Acts 1.14, it says, All of these, with their minds in full agreement, devoted themselves steadfastly to prayer. We pray and we worship because it creates an atmosphere that ushers in that desire. It ushers in that desperation, that need for a Holy Spirit encounter. It ushers in that hunger inside of us to seek him out. It awakens it. That's what it is. It's it's a desire. The word of God say they devoted themselves. Why? Because they had that need. They had that hunger. They were thirsty for more of God. They pushed in because they wanted more. They wanted to go deeper. And on this, the day of Pentecost, the disciples had themselves in the upper room. And what were they doing? They were praying. They were pressing into things of him. They were pressing into his presence. Now see, when we approach with this desire, that's when the encounter can take place. Now, I know for one, I have been hurt. I have been through many trials, pains, and sufferings. I have been wounded. But through that atmosphere created through prayer and worship, I have been healed. So it's not just an encounter that takes place when we pray, when we worship. It creates an atmosphere for growth creates an atmosphere for healing. It creates an atmosphere where God can work in you, where you make yourselves, we make ourselves available to him and his spirit to continue to work in and through us, not only to break, but to bind up our wounds, to make us stronger, to give us the perseverance to run the race to the end. That is why we seek out his presence. That is why we need to have a desire to seek him every day. But check it out. It may not happen the first time, and that's okay. Keep pressing. Keep going. Remember, it may not always happen the first time, but maybe he wants to work in you a little bit more before he brings that something to pass, before he brings your healing before he brings that breaking point, before he brings that breakthrough, he may have something he wants to do in you first before he gives you what you need. But the desire has to be in your heart. Knowing that he is real and that he is unwavering, never changing. It's that level of relationship, the level of revelation, the Holy Spirit. It's how the spiritual realm works. And one key to access it is the desire to be in full agreement, not only with each other, but with what the Spirit wants to do in and through us. See, our mind, just like the disciples were in, one, in full agreement in one accord, our minds need to be in full agreement in one accord, in full submission. And then the Holy Spirit takes over and does the rest. 
but only when we are ready to truly let go of control, to truly submit all to him and truly allow him to take over. Because if there's even a little bit of us in it, nothing's going to move. Maybe it moves a little bit, but then you'll find yourself three, four steps back behind where you started, starting all over again. But you see, the disciples were in full agreement, and that is what happened, what took place on the day of Pentecost. They were devoted in one accord. They were devoted in one mind. They were devoted, pressing towards the same goal. There was such an alignment with the Spirit and such a submission. There was a, and this was the key to tapping into new levels of grace, tapping into new levels of the spiritual realm, tapping into new levels of God's character. So I want to ask us a couple questions this morning. I just want you to meditate on them as we continue this message. How real is God to you? How real is God to you? Can he do all things or can he only do some things? Can he break you out of whatever is trying to trap you? Or can he only open the door and tell you to walk out? How submitted are our minds? Have we submitted everything to him this morning? Are we holding back that last bit that we don't want to let go of? That last bit that we say, no, I want to control this part. Are we afraid to let go of control? Do we have a desire this morning to understand, truly understand the revelation of the spirit, the revelation of heaven? Because when we do these things, when God is absolutely real to us, doing all things in and through our lives, when we have submitted ourselves, mind, body, and soul to him, and when we have the desire to seek him out every morning, all the things that we need, all our desires, everything else will follow after. But we have to be in his presence daily. The Bible tells us to continually seek him out, to seek him and his righteousness first and all things shall be added unto us. Now let us look at this. If we lack that desire, it's like casting pearls before swine. And Jesus warned us about this in, in Matthew 7, 6. It says, do not give what is holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine lest they trample them under their feet, then turn and tear you in pieces. Do not give what the Lord has blessed you with to those who will continually tear you down. Do not give what the Lord has given to you to those who speak ill, who gossip about you, who talk behind your back and tear into you from behind. Because they're waiting. They're waiting for you. To slip up and then they will do as this, as this verse says. They will turn and tear you in pieces. The devil is waiting just around the corner for us to slip up in a way that he makes us think, oh, God will never bring us back from that. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit tells us all things are possible because our God is the God of what? the impossible. But you see, there's an intimacy between God and man that results in two things that we saw in Daniel 11. It results in strength and the ability, the capacity to demonstrate the reality of God's kingdom here and now. So have we had that revelation? 
Have we had that knowledge given to us, passed to us through the Holy Spirit? See, the Word of God says we're married to the Holy Spirit, man and woman alike. He is our first love. But if we're always saying, I know, I know, I got it, don't worry about it, I got it, it's okay. We may have also received the seed of doubt, the seed of fear, the seed of complaining, the seed of complacency. See, if we're truly married to the Spirit and receive the seed of the Spirit, the good seed of the Spirit, we wouldn't have received or been married to the seed of doubt, fear, complaining, or complacency. We'll have received the seed of grace, the, the seed of faith, the seed that causes us to desire that hunger to be in his presence. See, we can know the Bible front to back, cover to cover, but we don't know the author. We need a genuine encounter with him. What does this mean? It means that it means truly knowing him. And I gave us some of these keys earlier, but I want to mention them again. It means truly knowing him. It's being able to hear his voice when he calls to us, when he speaks to us. It's being able to call upon him and knowing, being confident that he will answer no matter what. Because he is our almighty God when we have that faith. It's being able to touch his manifest presence in our desperation. It's being face to face with him. These are the desires. This is the desperation we need to have. We need to be desperate to know him. We need to be desperate to hear his voice. We need to be desperate to call on him, the desire to call on him continually. We need to be desperate to touch his presence and to be face to face with him. We need to be desperate to get back to our first love. If there is no desperation to come back to him, then what's going on? If there is no desperation, if there's no desire, no need to be with him again, then what is truly working in our hearts? See, there is a spiritual system through which God leads us and lures us into his presence. I want us to check this out for a moment. God will lure us. He will draw us into his presence using the hunger he has already placed inside of us. Even if that hunger is just beginning, he will use that hunger to draw us back to him. Jesus said those who hunger and thirst will be satisfied. This morning, I want to take a look at Moses. In Exodus chapter 3, verse 2 says, The angel of the Lord appeared to Moses in a blazing flame of fire from the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush was on fire, yet it was not consumed. Now, you know, Moses didn't just wake up one day and say, Oh, I'm going to go seek out God. No, something happened, something triggered that hunger and desire to get to know God, to go towards God. God put that burning bush in his path to draw Moses into his presence. Because just think if that burning bush wasn't there, would Moses have stopped into that cave? Would he have turned away from the flock? Or would, have he, would he have kept going and passed it by, passed that encounter by. See, he put a burn, burning bush in Moses' path to lure him into an encounter with God. And Ecclesiastes 3.11 tells us, he has made everything beautiful and appropriate in its time. 
He has also planted eternity, a sense of divine purpose for each and every one of his children in the human heart. A mysterious longing which nothing under the sun can satisfy except God. Yet man cannot find out. He cannot comprehend. He cannot grasp what God has done. Even the Bible tells us God has placed that desire, that hunger to search after him in our hearts already. Sometimes something has to trigger it, just as the burning bush triggered Moses. See, God has put things in our path to lure us, to draw us into an encounter with him. I want you to really think, what has God put in your path lately that has drawn you into his presence, that has lured you back to his heart? Exodus 3.3 3 tells us, so, so, so Moses said, I must turn away from the flock and see this great sight, why the bush is not burned up. See, this was the luring, the drawing of the Spirit. But you see, God isn't going to just pull us into it. He puts something in our path and lets us decide to come into his presence. He's not going to force us into his presence because he is a gentleman. But he will put things in our path that will draw us, that will draw our attention and draw our heart towards him. So Moses had to go and find out what was going on. In a way, it almost reminds me of when we're driving on the freeway. You know how when something that's out of the ordinary starts happening on the side of the road? Everybody starts slowing down and looking over, what's going on? What's happening? That's the world putting a burning bush for you to slow down and look. What has the Lord put in your life recently that's made you slow down? Have you slowed down to look for the things of the Spirit? Or have you, just like we do on the freeway, raced by when we don't want to pay attention? Are we looking? Or are we shutting it out so we don't have to go there? Verse 4 and 5 says, When the Lord saw that Moses turned away from the flock to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am, Lord. God said, Do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet out of respect because the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And this is the first step to knowing God. Taking your shoes off, but not your physical shoes, not all the time, those spiritual shoes. And those spiritual shoes represent what the world has told you, the world's perception of God what the world has poured into you about who they think God is. See, God says take them off because he wants to reveal something new to us, something that can only be revealed through the Holy Spirit. No man, no mere book, no nothing of the world can reveal the things that God wants to reveal. Only through the Holy Spirit does the word of God come alive. See, we have acquired so much worldly knowledge about who God is. We've heard from our parents. We've heard from people on the street. We've even heard maybe something from people in church about who they think God is. But I want to ask you, who is God to you? See, his revelation, his revelation becomes our ministry. And when God is ready to give us an encounter with his spirit, 
He will compel us to take off our spiritual shoes, to lay aside every perception everyone else has told us so that we can create a space for him to reveal himself personally to us, to reveal who he is and what he can do. See, I want, to, I want to show you something for a moment. No one in the history of human beings has ever sat down and just said, oh, I want to be a prophet. I want to be an apostle. I want to be an evangelist. No, they don't say they want to. That hunger, that desire, it's stirred within them. And when you walk in your calling, you begin to look different. People begin to see you differently and you begin to look similar to those who hold a similar office. See, being in tune with God means we can attain a level of grace. If we look at Noah, there was a level of grace. See, he didn't have to go out and look for the animals to come. They came by the compulsion of God. See, you can be hidden in a cave. You can be hiding wherever you want. You can run as far as you want to. But the Spirit, those animals He sends, that person He sends, will still find you. No matter where you go, no matter how far you run. See, it's a level of grace. This only comes when we have that connection, that revelation of the ministry of the Spirit. But know this, know this, our hunger to know God is what will define His possibilities in our lives. Exodus 3, 13 and 14 say, Then Moses said to God, Behold, when I come to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers, your ancestors has sent me to you. And they say to me, what is his name? What then shall I say to them? This was a good question to ask. And I want to show you why. In verse 14, said, God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, you shall say this to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God said, I am who I am. In other words, God's saying to be able to list all my characteristics, all my traits, everything that I am. It would take an eternity to tell you. But how you receive Moses, how the people receive my prophet will determine who I am to you. So how do you receive his prophet? How do we receive his word? How do we receive the word from the people he sends to us? That determines if he's real to you or not. God said, God said, I am. He said, I am who I am. See, Moses here, he had a closeness with God. So if you didn't receive Moses, you didn't receive God because you didn't understand how God works. You don't, if you don't receive the prophet, you're not really rejecting the prophet. If you're not, if you reject the person God sends to you, you're not really rejecting the person. You're rejecting God. So we must be careful of who we turn away. We must be careful of how we speak to others. See, many of us are representing, representing a God we don't fully understand. We're representing a God we don't fully know. We're representing a God we are unsure of. 
That's why it's so hard for many people to obey Him, to believe in Him, to stand upon Him no matter what they're going through. But you see, faith, it wasn't about something that we were forced to, or for, it was never meant to be something we force ourselves into. It's never supposed to be something we forced ourselves to believe in Him for. Faith is supposed to be a natural response to a genuine encounter with the Holy Spirit. Faith is supposed to be a natural response we have when we encounter a move of God, when we encounter signs, miracles, and wonders. Faith is supposed to be a natural response our, our spirit has to His Spirit. And it's our conviction after experiencing God's moving in our life. But this is what's missing in the body of Christ at large today. So we use all kinds of skills. Many people use all kinds of skills in an attempt to replace that desire, to replace the hunger, the desperation, and the need to have a Holy Ghost encounter, to have a genuine encounter with Him. See, the nation of Israel was not powerful because it had numbers. The nation of Israel was powerful because they went off of a Holy Ghost encounter. The nation of Israel was powerful because when they moved in that experience, God's hand fell, God's grace, God's power fell in their favor. Look at this. Moses told God, do not send me unless you go with me as well. Unless your presence goes with me. And see, David had many encounters with the Holy Spirit as well. He had many encounters where he pleaded and he was desperate for the Spirit of God. Look at Psalms 51.11. It says, do not cast away. Do not cast me away from your presence. Do not take your spirit from me. He's pleading because he's desperate to keep the connection to God. He's desperate and has a hunger to continue to keep God, the Spirit, at the center of his life. Even though everything David did, God still loved him. And he poured his spirit out upon him. And then Psalms 110 verse 1 tells us, The Lord Father says to my Lord, the Messiah, his Son, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. So not only was he desperate, was he hungry, was he had, did he have a desire to continue seeking out the Spirit of God? But in the Spirit, he says, look, I see God. I see his Son. I've had an experience in the spiritual realm. See, we have multiple Experience, encounters with God each and every day. We have multiple encounters with God. But are we open? Are we available to see His glory in our lives? Are we open and available to see and watch for those burning bushes in our lives? Psalms 100, 3 through 5 tells us no, perceive recognize and understand with approval that the Lord is God. It is He who has made us, not we ourselves, and we are His. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. Enter into His gates with thanksgiving and a thank offering and into his courts with praise. Be thankful and say so to him. Bless and affectionately praise his name. For the Lord is what? The Lord is good. 
His mercy and loving kindness are everlasting. His faithfulness and His truth endure to all generations. I want to point out right here, in verse 4, it says gates. So there are levels, there are multiple levels of gates that we can enter into. Some of us, we're still on the outside looking in. We're still right there like that kid at the, at the candy store window looking in, pressing our face to the window, saying, can I come in? Am I ready yet, Lord? Can I do it? Many of us need to take that next step, press in further so that we can get into his gates. See, in the upper room during Pentecost, they kept meeting with each other. They kept pressing in. The disciples kept pushing farther, keeping that hunger and keeping that need for his presence and his spirit. They had to go through multiple level, levels. And it didn't happen overnight. Pressing in and getting into the gates is not a one and done kind of thing. It's pressing in. It's without ceasing. As the Bible tells us, pray without ceasing. What does that mean? Keep pressing. Keep pushing. Don't stop seeking His presence. Continually seek Him out. See, the disciples, they had to be fully submitted. They had to understand God truly, genuinely understand God. And they had to have a revelation of who he was. Not just of who he was to the body of Christ as a whole, but who he was to them personally. And just like Moses, if the Israelites didn't receive him, and then that was the level they received God because they didn't know how God worked. The level you receive, the people God sends in your life is the level you receive God at. So let us be careful how we receive the things of God. Let us make sure that we are receiving the things of God with an open heart, an open spirit. See, their level of God was the level of knowing God's prophet. It says in the, in the Bible, you shall say this to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. How they received Moses, how you receive modern day Moses will, deter will determine who he is to you. And see, there are levels. There are levels in this Christian walk of ours. And it will determine our walk. Just like the Israelites. How they received Moses was who God was to them. How we receive the modern day Moses is who God is to us. So are we receiving him with a whole heart? With a submitted heart? With a grateful heart? Or are we doing what the Israelites did? Who are you? Who sent you? We don't know this God. He hasn't answered us. Let us remember, not only does God answer personally, but he will send his people, his prophets, his apostles, his evangelists to answer as well. So don't, let's not, Let's not stop at receiving just directly from God. Let's keep receiving from those he sends to us, those he has put us under, those that he has put as the, the ones who speak into us, the ones who encourage us, the ones who uplift us. Keep seeking. Keep looking. Keep pausing to see those burning bushes in our lives and let us continue seeking out with a hunger and desperation those Holy Ghost encounters that we may continually, continually seek His face at all times.
So at this time, I'd like to slow down the service for a moment. Come into a time of reflection, meditation, and just meditate on what the Lord has told us this morning. So I invite you at this time, just close your eyes, bow your heart, and just think about what He has told you this morning. Father, we come before you. We thank you this morning. We thank you for all that you have told us this morning. We thank you, Father, for the revelations you have placed, Father God, at our doorsteps, the revelations and the enlightenment you have brought this morning, Father God. We pray that we may continually press towards you, Father God, that we may continually, Father, come towards you and draw towards your spirit, Father. I pray that we never lose that hunger, that desire, that desperation to be in your presence, Father God. I pray this morning that we may always come to a point of knowing, perceiving, recognizing that you are our Lord. You are good. You are the good shepherd, Father God. And we can do nothing in in and of ourselves, Father, for only you, Father, only you, the one who created us in our mother's womb, can do these things for us, Father God. Father, your word tells us that we are your people. We are your sheep, Father God. We pray that your presence continually guides us, Father God, in your ways. That your presence continually guides our feet, Father God. Your word says that when we have plans, when we come before you and give them to you, you will order our steps, Father. We pray that as we come into our next season, Father, as we come into the next thing we're about to do, Father God, as we come into the next step, Father God, that you would place it on your rock. That no matter where we go, no matter what we're doing, we are always in your presence, on your foundation. Let us continually stand upon your foundation, which is your son, Jesus Christ. Father, we pray that every time we come into your presence, every time we enter into your gates, we come with a heart of thankfulness, of gratefulness, remembering what you have done for us, Father God. Let us continually remember, Father, where you brought us from. Do not let us forget our roots, Father God. Do not let us forget the pit you raised us, raised us out of, Father God, and how far you have brought us, Father For without you, Father God, we would not be here, Father God. Without you, Father, we would be lost still. We would still be wandering in the midst, Father, in the darkness, Father. Father, we come before you. We praise you this morning, Father. For you are good, Father God. You are a good, good Father. We thank you, Father God, for continuing to show your mercy for continuing to show your loving kindness, Father God, for continuing to shower us with your grace, your favor, your love, Father. And we pray as we continue to press towards you, Father God, that you would continually reveal a new level of your spirit, a new level of your character, a new level of who you are to us day by day, Father God. And we pray that when we come into your presence, Father God, Not only do we remember what you have done, but what you are doing, Father God. We remember who you are to us, Father. You are our Savior, Father God. You are my healer, Father God. You are my rock. You are my salvation, Father. And I praise you this morning in all that you are, Father God. We praise you this morning that you continue, Father God, to guide us in what we have. We thank you, Father for continuing, Father God, in your grace, in your mercy, in your love, Father, down to all generations, Father God, and in Jesus' mighty and powerful name, this morning we proclaim, amen and amen.